Um, I'm so proud to introduce the next person that we have here. Um, and I think I can speak on behalf of all the California Community College teacher preparation leads that are in the room right now. Um, for over 30 years, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond has made rich and varied contributions to the field of education. But rather than recite a complete list of her accomplishments as an introduction, I would rather describe Linda Darling-Hammond's impact on the teacher preparation systems and stakeholders that are represented here today, specifically her influence, her research, and her crystal clear thinking that has created the framework for meaningful teaching, learning, student equity, and policy in California and throughout the United States. Linda Darling-Hammond began her career as a public school teacher. She co-founded both a preschool and a public high school, and this is a great reminder, she's one of us. She served as director of Rand Corporation's education program and has an endowed professor, oh, excuse me, and as an endowed professor at Columbia University Teachers College before serving at Stanford University. Linda Darling Hammond is currently the president of the California State Board of Education. Among her more than 600 publications are a number of award-winning books, including many favorites, such as, and these are going to, I think a lot of us have these in our, in, in our uh, libraries, Right to Learn, Teaching as the Learning Profession, Preparing Teachers for a Changing World, and The Flat World and Education, How America's Commitment Will Determine Our Future. Linda Darling-Hammond has, pro has provoked significant change through her work in policy reform, and this change has had a direct influence on what happens in the classrooms for both teachers and students. Specifically, her recent research has addressed the teacher shortage in, Cal in excuse me, the shortage of teachers in the field, the need for high quality teacher preparation for those going into the field of education, and most importantly, developing truly equitable classrooms and schools for our students in California and across the nation. Much of her thinking looks at challenges in education holistically, the needs of the student. Let me say that again. The needs of the student are at the forefront of her career and her mission. Particularly those students who are at risk are the basis for analysis of this teacher shortage, school funding shortfalls, and underperformance of schools and school districts. Linda continuously reminds us that the key to all we do is the needs of the students and all the paths that lead back to student success. Based on her insights and penetrating views of, education, of the education landscape, Dr. Darling Hammond has created a map for the future of, Calif of education in California, a place to expand, a place to thrive, and a place to strive to do what's best for our students, our classrooms, our schools, communities, both as education leaders and as partners. Thus, the California Community College's teacher preparation programs with ongoing support from our Chancellor's Office would like to honor Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond with the Outstanding Educator Award. This award is a symbol of the deep gratitude teacher preparation leads and our education systems have. Sorry, I've, I've followed this person for my whole career, so I'm very excited. <laughs> um, this award, oh goodness, sorry. <laughs> this award is a symbol of the deep gratitude teacher preparation leads and our education systems have for Linda Darling Hammond's work. Thank you, Linda, for your significant contributions to the field of education and specifically the areas of teacher preparation. I was so worried something would happen to your award. <laughs> Sorry I didn't have the award out because I was so worried it was going to break. I kept it in until the very end. <laughs> oh, I even carried this on the airplane. Oh, my gosh. No mess around on this one. This is the it's Outstanding Educator Award presented to Linda from the California Community College System and all of our teacher preparation programs for her years of dedication. Thank you so much. I'm so worried it would break. Thank you, Linda. Beautiful. <clears throat> well, 
I'm overwhelmed. I'm verklempt, as they say. <laughs> um, and really delighted to be here um, with some of the people uh, who I most admire and respect uh, in uh, the state of California and, uh, and really anywhere. I've studied education across the country and around the world, and I will say that California educators impress me the most. You know, with all of the challenges, um, the budget cuts, all of the processes we've been through in this state, there are so many amazing people here doing the work that is the most important work in our society. Um, teaching is the centerpiece of a successful society. We don't always uh, have that recognition as obvious here in the United States as in some other places. Um, I did a book recently called Empowered Educators, which took me to five countries around the world, one of which was Singapore, uh, where they think of teachers as nation builders, and where the chancellor, or the, where the president and the prime minister and the folks who run the government unilaterally raise salaries regularly so that teachers are as well paid as any other professionals in society. They don't even have to collectively bargain for that. Uh, they just see the value of teachers. Um, and teacher education is a sacred trust, especially now as so much depends uh, on those of us who are engaged in teacher education. Because uh, we're in a moment where uh, the world is changing rapidly. You cannot succeed as an individual or as a society without uh, you know, high quality of learning. Uh, and teachers desperately want to do what is best for their children. Uh, they're in the profession, not for the money. If they are there for that reason, they forgot to check the salary schedule before they went in. Um, but because they want to make a difference. And to do that, they need the knowledge and the skills that allow them to meet the very different needs of every individual child. And for them to do that, they need teacher educators who really understand that this, uh, this mission of giving them the tools that will allow them to succeed is at the heart of our democratic society. It's a crazy and wild time in our country in many respects and in our world. But one aspect of this is that the pace of you know, knowledge is growing uh, rapidly. And the way in which our kids are going to use what they learn is dramatically different than what it was when I was growing up in a Midwestern city where people could leave school without a high school diploma, take their lunchbox down to the factory, you know, do that assembly line work over and over again, and, you know, get a good salary, buy a house, raise a family, and have a good life. Those jobs are gone. Automation is you know, happening at a very rapid pace. I live in Silicon Valley. Driverless cars are driving around. The number of, uh, you know, uh, they say truck driver jobs will be gone in 20 years. You know, we just won't have that sector. Most uh, empl uh, employees will be working at jobs that haven't even been invented yet. I am a Stanford uh, professor, and I hate to quote people from Cal Berkeley. I know they're in the house. <laughs> who's, who's here from Berkeley? As always, people in the house, I know. But there are these professors at, at Cal who are doing this amazing research on the growth of knowledge in the world. And they found out that between 1999 and 2003, there was more new knowledge created in the world in that four-year period than in the entire history of the world preceding. Think about that. And knowledge at about the year 2000 began to increase exponentially. Technology knowledge is doubling every 11 months, and that statistic is old, so I'm probably giving it too much time. It's probably shorter than that now. And so what does that mean? It means that we can't just say, here's what you need to know, and we're going to divide the knowledge facts up into the 12 years of school, and you're going to memorize a certain number of them each year and spit them back on tests and be ready for the world that you're going into. In fact, our young people are going to have to work with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, using technologies that haven't been invented yet, solving enormous problems that we have not managed to solve, that will keep our species alive on the planet, that will you know, provide clean air and water and food and uh, hopefully some peace uh, among nations. Uh, so what we need for them to be able to do is the kind of deep accessing knowledge, you know, uh, having critical thinking and problem solving skills, being their own uh, managers of their learning over time. Um, so it's not going to be the transmission curriculum, of course, that we, many of us, grew up with. 
Uh, and the schools that we grew up in were designed you know, for the transmission of that curriculum. So we're at this moment where teaching is changing and the job requires much more sophisticated knowledge and skills. We have a very diverse uh, student population with a growing range of needs. And so the job of teaching uh, is uh, in increasingly complex. And the job of teacher education is to enable our society to move forward in this way. And nothing else works in education without a stable supply of well-prepared teachers. Nothing else works in education without a stable supply of well-prepared teachers. And quite often this work gets marginalized uh, as though it somehow people could magically appear and could magically do this complex work uh, without the opportunity to learn. And in this case, uh, when we think about how we help our candidates learn, they need to be in settings, they need to be in school settings that represent the world that they're coming into. They need to be in those you know, lighthouse schools that are innovating, that are moving things forward, that are giving them the independent thinking and critical problem solving skills um, and so that they can see what those pedagogies are because many of them will not have had those pedagogies in their own in their own educational experience. So part of the job of teacher education now is not only moving us towards deeper learning, towards you know, an inquiry approach to learning that is, uh, allows people to build that learning to learn capacity, uh, but it's also uh, understanding that uh, kids have to become self-managing in their learning, and they have to be able to uh, experience that. If you think about the history of the human species, inquiry is at the core of everything we have ever done. Everything around you is a function of somebody having said, oh gee, what happens if I drop the meat in the fire? Ah, tastes better, you know, let's try it another way. Maybe we'll add some Crisco oil and see what that does to it, you know. <laughs> but everything we do, you know, whether it's you know, building you know, architectural structures, whether it's flying airplanes, whether it's you know, um, you know, healing human beings, is a, has come about through inquiry, through people saying, what would happen if I did this? and then trying it, and then figuring out what works, and then making it better, and making it better. So that is the core human learning function. Uh, and so our, our classrooms and our schools have to be built around how do we help people become good inquirers into the world around them to invent all of the things that are going to need to continue to be invented. We also know about the importance of social and emotional learning in ways that we perhaps didn't know 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Emotion and learning are completely connected. If you come into a classroom and you trust that teacher, you feel good about your classmates, you feel that you are seen as a valuable, competent, member of the community, not in a stigmatized role where social identity threat or stereotype threat is impinging on your capacity to do the work, you learn more. And if you come into a classroom where you are feeling insecure uh, about how you're seen, what your relationships are, where you may have experienced trauma or adverse conditions outside of school, uh, then you learn less well. And so we have to build classrooms and schools where teachers know how to bring uh, strong social and emotional supports, uh, identity safe environments, restorative practices um, to the environment. Uh, and uh, those humane school environments uh, need to be part of where we place candidates when they do their clinical experiences, uh, hopefully for as long as possible. I live for a day where every beginning teacher will have had a full year at least of clinical experience in a high quality environment, a professional development school, like a teaching hospital, uh, where they can see in practice uh, the things that we want them to learn to do, and where their coursework helps them understand why and how they can do more of it. I would set that as a goal for us, uh, as part of where we're going uh, in California. Thankfully, we have a governor who understands the importance of teaching and teacher education, and we can build on the progress from our previous governor as well. You know, we've had a slippery slope in California after Proposition 13, 
Uh, John Merrow did a movie called From First to Worst because we were indisputably the highest performing state in education in the 1970s. And after Prop uh, 13 in 1979, it went down, down, down. All of you who are of an age will remember the cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts uh, that we experienced. Uh, so by 2007, we were 50th in the nation. We had made ourselves into a southern state educationally. We were 50th in the nation in staffing in terms of the number of uh, pupils, you know, teachers to pupil and administrators to pupil. We were 47th or 48th in achievement on English and math uh, and science. We had below average graduation rates. Um, Governor Jerry Brown put in the local control funding formula which began with Proposition 30 to bring new resources into schools, new standards, new assessments, a new accountability system, really grounded in an image of the whole child and a whole child educational approach uh, to shift from a, from a test and punish environment to an assess and improve environment. And guess what? Over the five years that that was fully you know, in, in effect, we went from 48th in the country in eighth grade reading to almost at the national average. We're just one point away from the national average now. We closed the gap in math by half from where we were at 47th. Now we're um, halfway to the national average. Uh, graduation rates uh, improved greatly. We are now uh, slightly above the national average in graduation rates. Uh, but we are not done. We need to go from worst to first. That's got to be our goal. And when I think about what it will take to go from worst to first, so to speak, uh, I think about what I saw when I was in Finland and Singapore and some other countries that have really invested in the quality of teaching. If you were to become a teacher in one of those countries, you would come into a very high quality preparation program that is supported to have, uh, as in Finland, model schools. Every one of those, just like medicine has teaching hospitals. By the way, those didn't exist before 1910, before the Flexner Report. Now, everywhere you train in the world, in a medical school, you will train in a teaching hospital attached to that school, which exemplifies best practices. Well, in Finland, they have model schools and partner schools that are the sources of um, learning connected to the curriculum with the professors. The, the faculty in those uh, model schools our faculty in the university, they have an appointment in the university. The faculty in the university are also working in those schools. It's all integrated. You would go into a program like that completely free uh, with a stipend or a salary while you train. You would graduate from that, and now I'm talking about Singapore as well. You would have a uh, mentor available as soon as you get into your school setting. In Singapore, that mentor would be on a career ladder, a senior teacher who's had mentoring training and is right there ready to receive you and support you through your uh, beginning years in the profession. You would have readily available professional development in every area of the curriculum and every part of the work that you're trying to do throughout your career. Much of a teacher-led uh, and teacher-supported uh, through both those universities and through academies for teaching. Uh, you would be paid at the same level as other college graduates, uh, and you would uh, be respected uh, throughout the um, country and um, beyond. So we're on a path. We're on a path, and we have to know kind of where we're going. Uh, we are, as you know, um, going to experience a tremendous growth in early childhood education. And these partnerships with the community colleges and the CSU and other four-year colleges are going to be central to training this new, growing workforce uh, in early childhood education. In getting down to facts, this group of studies that were recently done, uh, the uh, folks who looked at student achievement found that in our K through 12 schools, uh, kids progress as well as kids of similar income levels in any state in the country, in fact, a little better. But they start school further behind on average because we have so little investment in early childhood. So we have to solve that problem. Governor Newsom is absolutely committed to doing that. There will be this enormous role for everyone here and your colleagues in building new programs that really are rooted in how we understand children and their development. I have two tiny grandchildren. We got to get on this right away. 
<laughs> before they get there. Uh, and uh, and then we, we uh, need to address the shortages that we've had. We've had very deep shortages of teachers uh, over recent years. Uh, so in the previous administration, we had $35 million going to build undergraduate teacher education programs. So we've, some of you are probably designing some of those model programs. I see some people nodding, so go team go. Uh, we're going to want to add to that. Um, I, Appreciate the CTC for the work it did to get that going, and there's some really beautiful program models that uh, are part of that work. We have $75 million that's gone into teacher residencies so that we can, in high need communities, bring in people who train under the wing of the very best teachers in those kind of partner schools um, and get their coursework from the university wrapped around it. In a year, they can end up with a master's degree uh, and full certification. They get mentoring, and then they commit several years to work in that district and start to actually solve the shortage with well-prepared teachers who are committed to staying. Uh, and in this last budget, Governor Newsom has uh, allocated $89 million for service scholarships for individuals coming into teaching uh, to give them $20,000 apiece to get through programs in high need areas, going to high need schools. Another $35 million in professional development for English learner um, develop, uh, teaching, special education, social and emotional learning, computer science, ethnic studies. 200 plus million dollars for pre-K, pre uh, which will grow over time to ensure that we have a well-prepared workforce. So we are on a path, and we won't stop until we get there. So that every teacher and every school leader in every setting from K-12 and beyond, I will say from pre-K-12 and beyond, has access to all the knowledge and all the skills they need to do the job they want to do for each and every child they teach. And you are the spark plugs for that knowledge sharing process. So I thank you for the work you do. I encourage you to uh, redouble your efforts. I know you're already working you know, max speed, but uh, really help us carry this vision forward for the state of California and for every student therein. Thank you.